The grace and peace of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be with you all and welcome to the Wake Forest Church of the Nazarene this morning, bright and beautiful as it is, where we have gathered underneath all of the grandeur of our Lord and Savior Jesus to worship His holy name, to offer to Him our prayers and our praises this morning and to receive from Him His bountiful, all-sufficient grace. voice and I bless his name forevermore my life's been changed he lives and he lives when darkness comes and hides his face I fear the end of unending grace he lives and he lives when I'm buried in life's lonely grave when God is silent and I'm forced to wait, if resurrection is not found today, does He live? And I will live because He lives. And I will live because He lives. In me, in me, I believe, I believe. The tomb is empty and we sing his praise The Holy Spirit comes and fills this place He lives And he lives and When we gather to mourn a loss Before new life there stands a cross He lives he lives when hope is lost and we cannot pray when God is silent and we're forced to wait if resurrection is not found today does he live and we Give me 
May your Holy Spirit descend upon us now and fill these lungs, fill these minds, fill these hearts, that we might be your sanctuary, that we might be the dwelling place of your Spirit, that we might be the holiness of your name. Oh Lord, today we thank you for the splendor of creation. We thank you for your goodness to us and to all those who are alive. We thank you, O oh God, for your blessings more than we can count or name. We thank you, O oh God, for the gift of life, for your sustaining spirit amongst us. We thank you, O oh Lord, that in the fullness of time you sent forth Jesus to be our Redeemer. We thank you, O oh God, that he loved us all the way to the end, and that on the other side of resurrection he demonstrated the full potential and power of your spirit, that he ascended into heaven and sent that same spirit to dwell amongst us. Oh God, we pray that that Spirit would fill us now. That we may be your workers. For we see the fields around us ripe for harvest. We see those bodies that are broken and hurting, those spirits that are, that are downcast. And we ask, oh God, that your Spirit would use us to be the ones who bring good news, who bring sight to the blind and release to the captives. We do pray, oh God, for this place where we are at right now and those who are being uh, impacted by disease and by losses of jobs. And we ask, O oh God, that you would bring healing and sustainment to our lands. O oh Lord, we trust that you are guiding us into paths of fruitfulness, into places of blessing. And we pray, O oh God, that in the name of our Savior, would you lead this we ask in the name so strong and powerful, the same Jesus who in his mercy taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom 
and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen and amen. Romans chapter 12. Invite those who are able to stand this morning. If you're obviously if you're sitting in a car, you don't need to. But if if you are able, I would invite you to stand in honor of God's word. Hear now the word of the Lord from Romans 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is the good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we are many members, and not all the members have the same function, So we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the the compassionate in cheerfulness. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I want to start today explicitly and robustly and with fervor by declaring to you that I'm going to make a logical fallacy. It's a logical fallacy that preachers are kind of fond of making. Specifically, it's called a hasty generalization. A hasty generalization is when, with very little evidence, someone makes large and generalizing claims. I just want you to know at the beginning that I know it's a fallacy, and you know that I know, so we can just move on with it. Just deal with it if it bothers you. Uh, In all honesty, I'm actually borrowing some of this from a guy named Peter Rawlings, who's a philosopher, theologian, crazy man. Uh, So this is my hasty generalization this morning. There are certain religions that unite, that that coalesce, that that arise from a, a, a pleasure principle. They come to you and they offer you completion and wholeness and and certainty. You can have what you want. You can be what you want. You can be all you can be. And those religions can be secular or sacred, but they're, they're based on this pleasure, this fulfillment principle. There are other religions, something that Peter Rollins calls the reality principle. That's what they're based on. And they, they, they look at the world and the suffering that confronts people and they, they say that, that the way you, what you must do is be detached. Remove yourself. You must uh, uh, let go uh, from the world and from society. That the way to find anything of meaning is to release, to detach, to transcend. Now, generally, again, this is logical fallacy, just go along with me, Generally, the pleasure uh, principle religions arise in the West. Uh, That's that's the things we mostly know. And and the the Eastern uh, religions often are are these reality-based, the reality principle, excuse me. Now, there are exceptions to this, but but when you look at the world from 30,000 feet up, you have have, uh, uh, Eastern religions, things like Buddhism and Taoism and uh, uh, Hinduism, to the extent that you can find that as a religion. And, And they emphasize letting go. They talk about detachment, removing yourself, uh, transcending, going um, in the lotus position. You know, I, I can't actually do that or else I would show you, but I would, I would not get up. Buddhism talks a lot about the reality of suffering. Taoism imagines a fern leaf floating down life, unattached, unencumbered. And then you have Western religions. Things like Christianity and Islam and and secular consumerism that that tends towards the language of of wholeness, of of completion, of fulfillment, of pleasure. If you have faith in Jesus, if you pray to Mecca seven times a day, if you buy Gucci shoes, you can have fulfillment. 
Now remember, this is a hasty generalization, and at their best, I don't think that those, those archetypes work. But, and, and clearly, I guess I should say, I am clearly biased because I do think that faith in Jesus has a lot tied up in finding a wholeness. But just go with me. Because at their worst, the, these two ideas tend to some pretty dangerous concepts. If you're only grappling with the, the reality of life, if, you, if you're focused on, on, on suffering and, and de, uh, de limiting suffering and being detached and, and, and being uh, transcendent, then then you can end up in some dangerous things called nihilism and, and meaninglessness, arbitrariness, uh, everything is arbitrary. To quote from Bohemian Rhapsody, nothing really matters. Nothing really matters to me. That's where you end up with. At its worst, the, the pleasure principle can lead to hedonism. All that matters is my desire, my fulfillment. All that matters is me getting completion and accomplishments. And if we're honest, I, I think we can see how certain forms of, of Western religion get there. The prosperity gospel comes to mind. That, that, that Jesus and God exist to bless you and, and make you happy and give you lots of stuff and make you rich and welcome and having good children. Focusing exclusively on, on heaven and eternal rewards. I think of those people who strap bombs to their chest and in hope of something they will get on the other side of their, their martyrdom and suicide. All of that in various ways takes this my pleasure, my fulfillment, my wholeness is all that matters. We have these two principles. The problem is we don't live over here and we don't live over here. We're, we're in this space between. Our lives are between those two. We are filled with anxiety and desire and doubt. We have all of this stuff we want, and we also have all of this suffering that we carry with us. And then, so what we do is we try to throw the two ideas together. We go to, to meditation on Wednesday night so that we can get up on, on Thursday morning feeling refreshed and go out and buy new shoes. We, we go to church on Sunday and sing about the peace of God's kingdom so that we can go out Monday through Friday and war with co-workers. We take vacations, going to the beach to get away from systems that drain our souls so that we can plunge back into reality when we get home. I, I said at its worst, Christianity can tend towards this pleasure principle. God will fulfill you and make you happy if you just read your Bible, if you just subscribe to our YouTube channel, if you just do X, Y, and Z, then life will be good and your children will be well behaved and you will be blessed. But I don't think that's what Christianity is. I think that's a misreading. I don't think it's a religion of the pleasure principle, but I also don't think it's a religion of the reality principle either. I think Christianity is in this place in the middle, in this weird, uncomfortable, odd place. In the words of Kierkegaard, Christianity is, is a religion of the absurd. Tertullian, much earlier, said something similar. He said, I believe in the crucifixion of the Son of God because it is absurd. That's, that sounds a little odd, I hope. I, I hope that sounds it was a little weird to you this morning. I can't tell through your mask and, and non-nodding and, and can't see anybody's face in their cars. But I'm just going to assume that that statement strikes you as, as just, a, just a little off-key. Kind of like if I were to proudly declare to you this morning that I believed in square triangles. Right? It doesn't quite work. If, if I were to say to you that, that only cowards are heroes doesn't work together. Usually what you have is you have certain people, I'm thinking of the radical atheists, Richard Dawkins and Sam Harrison, and they, they come to you and they say, Christianity is an absurd religion, and that's why you shouldn't believe in it. Then we have other people on the other side, uh, I'm thinking of uh, uh, Josh McDowell and Lee Strobel, and they, they'll come to you and they'll say, hey, Christianity isn't absurd at all. You should totally believe in it. And I want you to hear this morning 
that I think Christianity is completely absurd. It's cockeyed and ludicrous. And that is the exact reason why you should believe in it. You see, we live in, in the middle. We live between this, this, this suffering of the present age and, and the desires of our hearts. We live between what we want and what we are, between who we are and who we want to be, between having to act but having no idea how to act. We, we live in between in this place of doubt and uncertainty and anxiety, and this absurd and crazy existence defines us. And Christianity gives us the tools, gives us the story to live there. So the Bible, speaking of stories, it starts off with a story. The very first story in the Bible is about a garden, a man, and a woman. And everything is good there in the garden with the man and the woman until one day a snake shows up. Well, excuse me, I guess I should say there's a tree too. Garden, man, woman, tree. And the snake comes up and he says, Dude, like, lady, what you want in the world is on that tree. All of your desires, all of your hopes, all of your, your pleasure can be found there. If you just eat of that tree, you will have wholeness and fulfillment, and it will grant you all of your heart's desire. But they have a problem, because they have this reality in front of them. They were told not to eat of the tree. And that's all of us. We are stuck between our desires and the reality that we live in. I really want to be a rock star, but I am stuck in this dead-end job. You, we really want to, to travel the world, but we have a mortgage to pay next month. We have these voices in our heads. You really need to be happier to have more fun and more sex and more fulfillment. And the way that you have that is, is by filling in the blank, doing X. Uh, you know, if you just get a better job, you'll be happier. If you just get a bigger house, you'll be happier. If you just move forward with your life, you'll be happier. If you just find a different partner in life, you will be happier. And what's so brilliant about the garden is that the man and the woman, they do this. They break through reality. They grab hold of the thing that they desire. They consume their pleasure. And they think it's going to be a blessing. But it turns out to be a curse. Their eyes are open and they find themselves, instead of finding fulfillment and realizing their pleasure, that it's actually kind of awful. It really kind of stinks to get the thing that you want. Because we live in between. Hear Paul's words from Romans chapter 12. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. I, I don't know if you knew this, but that's not normally how sacrifices go. Right? Right? normally the, the sacrifice is, is dead. They don't stay living. Sacrifices by their natures are gone and done and killed and, and buried in the language of psychoanalysis. It is enacting our death drive to free us. You kill the sheep. You burn the bull. You leave the vegetables there to rot. It doesn't make any sense to talk about a living sacrifice. It's absurd. Jesus put it this way in Matthew 16. Those who try to save their lives will lose it. But those who lose their life for my sake will save it. In Galatians, Paul puts it even a little bit more starkly. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives within me. Paul says you have to give your life away. You have, to, you have to sacrifice it. Do this absurd thing because that is the only way that you can get out of the formation, the conforming that happens in the world. This is how our minds get reshaped and repurposed. This is what makes possible all the other stuff that, that Paul talks about in chapter 12. When you are a living sacrifice, you see the gifts all around you. 
when you are a living sacrifice, you can be a part of the body, the church formed with, with earlobes and, and kneecaps and that little bit of skin right between your thumb and your index finger that nobody knows what it's there for. All of these things start working together. We all give our lives away. We are all living sacrifices. We are all those who have died and yet somehow keep on living caught in between. Caught between the life we want and the reality we face every day. This absurd, sanctified middle. And here's the crazy part. But by, by entering into this place of a living sacrifice, when you forfeit those desires for pleasure and freedom, when you live as though you were dead, without holding on control, without grasping after all of the definitions that life that the world would tell you you should have, it frees you to live authentically. It frees you from the illusions that so often cloud us and distract us. It frees you from the anxiety. Now, it doesn't get rid of it. Being a living sacrifice doesn't, doesn't end the problems. It doesn't get rid of the doubt and the depression and the, 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 the existential crisis that we find ourselves in so often. We are still living in this mortal coil with pain and suffering and all of the stuff that goes on with it. But when we become a living sacrifice, that living is redefined. And Paul calls that redefinition grace. Verse 3, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Grace is what transforms the mind. Grace means you don't have to listen to that voice inside your head telling you to pursue your devices and desires. Grace is being released from the compulsion to define and acquire and sustain. Grace is that new life that is created on the other side of death. Grace is not escaping into the pleasure principle, nor is it throwing up your hands in resignation to the reality principle. It is existing in between a living sacrifice. Grace is coming to see that the only way that you can win is by surrender. We don't have kneeling benches up here we don't you know that's a place for you to come and and, and form and, and, and be in an act of surrender and, and i really wish we did because those places are how we liturgically enact our formation of being a living sacrifice we kneel down before the Lord, lowering ourselves, putting our, our bodies in this place of submission and humility, opening ourselves thereby to something new and different. In that place of lowliness, in that moment of sober judgment, there before the Lord on our knees, we find a measure of faith. We don't have kneeling benches down front, but today we do have some time. Some time to sit at the close of this service to be quiet and still. Some time to listen to the voice of grace that is stamping out the voice of anxiety. Some time to embrace this spiritual worship that is transforming and renewing. Some time to be in between a living sacrifice that is acceptable to God. We have some time to sing. All to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. 
now, Almighty God, might we have your grace this day poured out upon us, transforming and renewing us, that we might be in between, that we might be that absurd place of a living sacrifice, that we might be sustained through the tension of life, and that we might find in you hope and truth and freedom from the illusions. In the name of our living Savior, we pray. Let us sing together. God and the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with you all and give you peace. Amen.